Hello, 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 and welcome to Amnesty International presents The Secret Policeman's Ball Unlocked. And tonight we're doing Going for an English with a live Q&A after the VT from some of the original gang. I am so, so excited. I'm Deborah Francis-White, and I'm a comedian and podcaster and also an Amnesty ambassador. Now, uh, those of you who tuned in on Monday night uh, will know that we I'm did. A it's Spike, so I'm a comedian, uh, a podcaster, and also we, an now, You may have noticed we've had some now, technical issues tonight. Uh, uh, and one of the technical on issues is that I can now hear myself shouting. So I'm just going to take these out um, and uh, go without my headphones in an incredibly dangerous move. If you've been with us since 7.30, thank you for uh, your patience. Uh, very much appreciated. We don't know why we've had so many technical issues. We just know it's very on brand for 2020 for things to not go to plan. Um, now, some of you tuned in with us on Monday night um, and you know that we felt it really important to talk about uh, the current situation. And if you didn't, we're going to say it here now. Uh, Amnesty International and I feel it's very important that we are not silent on the structural racism and white supremacy that fueled the murder of George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and many more people in the United States of America and the rest of the world. We stand in solidarity with organizers and activists and join the call for immediate change to stop unlawful killings of black people and for those responsible to be held accountable. We will take a stand against racism and we will take a stand against white supremacy. Uh, a word on the title of the show, The Secret Policeman's Ball, it was designed to evoke a witnessing of violence in police states. And it's very important to remember at this time, that there is an awful lot of state violence in democracies. Now you might be watching this on YouTube, Twitter or Facebook, but you can only ask, you can only ask questions if you are on Facebook. So if you, if you want to ask a question, go to Facebook, Amnesty UK. And now a very important sketch, and a very wonderful sketch, going for an English, let's roll the VT. Amnesty's Secret Policeman's Ball was established in 1976 and it raised funds and awareness for human rights. This is your nine o'clock alarm call! 44 years later and 11 balls later, these events are now the stuff of legend. Good guy. Famous for bringing together unique combinations of performers and reimagined comedy sketches. They have been central to building the world's most powerful human rights movement, if we do say so ourselves. Now more than ever, we need to come together and recognise our collective power to promote and protect human rights. So Amnesty have kindly opened up their comedy archives for me. Step with me into the Narnia wardrobe. And we ask if at all possible, and it is possible, that you join or donate or at least amplify our wonderful amnesty movement by visiting the website and the links appearing at the bottom of the screen. Or if you're watching on Facebook, just click the donate button. Come on, that money that you're not using now, you're not going down the pub. Give it to human rights. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the secret policeman's ball unlocked. To new viewers, welcome, and to those who joined us on Monday, welcome back. Joining me today, comedy royalty, Mira Sayal, Sanji Pascar, Nina Wadia, Kulvinda Gear, and Nish Kumar. Today, <laughs> we are delving into and doing a thorough retrospective on going for an English. God damn it, guys. I mean, Bombay is the restaurant capital of the world, right? So how come every Friday night we end up in this dump? Because that's what you do, innit? You go out, you get tanked up on lussies and you go for an English. <laughs> Hello there. Welcome to the traditional English restaurant. My name is James. I shall be your waiter for this evening. <laughs> Can't 
understand a word you're saying. <laughs> hey, speak Hindustani, boy. <laughs> oh, go, go, leave it, leave it. I've, I've been here before. I'll handle this. <clears throat> All right, mate. <laughs> I say, James, huh? You're my might, ain't you, James? Sanjeev, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the sketch? Because what we saw there was it being performed at the Secret Policeman's Ball, but it first appeared on your sketch show, Goodness Gracious Me. Yeah, the history of it is that originally Sharat uh, Sardana and Richard Pinto, who wrote the sketch, uh, had written it and submitted it to The Real McCoy, which was a, a sketch show that Colvinder and Mira were involved in um, before us, but it was rejected there, uh, fortunately for us. And uh, when it came to us, we did it on radio. It, we all thought it was a great sketch, fabulously satirical, and kind of laid down the template for the reversal sketches that we then did across the series. And then when we did it for TV, uh, I then kind of wrote uh, some extra bits for it. And then when we did the uh, We Know Where You Live um, show, which uh, we've just seen a clip from, we then kind of changed little bits and tried to adapt it to, uh, I think it was the Wembley Arena I think we were in at the time. Mira, do you think you knew at the time that this was going to be a classic sketch for you? I don't think you ever know, actually. I mean, you know, I think it was in our very first episode. So we had loads of material, actually, to, to choose from. But this sketch did stand out because it was such a, a brilliant reversal, really simple, brilliant reversal. But no, I mean, I we thought it was great when we did it. It's something we all responded to. But I don't think you ever know the thing that is actually going to hook people's imagination the way that this did. You're quoted as saying that laughter is the best cure for prejudice. Uh, do you think that's been some kind of enduring ethos in your work? Do you still think that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we all collectively felt as we were doing the show that it was changing people's attitudes toward how, towards how we were viewed as a community. I mean, people just didn't think Asians had a sense of humour. Uh, you know, we were the sort of silent people that just served you in shops or mended your bones in the hospital, but people didn't think of us as being funny. And I think just that as a statement in itself changed a lot of people's perceptions. I think it's the time when the sketch came out, what was around the country, what was happening around the country at the time. Because you had your lager louts, you know, you had loads of the factors all high expectation. And then under, underneath all that, the passive Asian was suppressed really. And we didn't have a voice press like that you need a voice and i think that's what happened with all of us in that respect that mm. sketch opened it up to say look we know what's happening we're not mm. we're not we're not far away we're very aware and i think it was a generational thing as well and that was a new generation coming up and saying no we're not going to have this anymore we're going to stand up for it and, we, and and a lovely way to put it was in that sketch, we're not any indifferent. You know, we, we all ha we all have these differences that exist in us. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, in terms of tackling prejudice, I think humour is very powerful, but also uh, uh, annihilating Nazis. <laughs> I always remember uh, <laughs> Simon Munnery saying that the alternative comedians of the 80s were successful in bringing down Thatcher in the same way that the Berlin cabaret artists were so successful in bringing down the Third Reich. <laughs> <laughs> Good analogy. <laughs> it gets into the fabric of society, which is almost more important. It doesn't tend to topple governments, but it gets under the skin of the culture. And that cannot help but change politics over a period of generations. Um, Nish, you maybe can speak to this, because if it's not rude to say to everybody else, you were a child when this came on the television. Uh, yeah, I was uh, probably about... 12 years old when the first series of Goodness Gracious Me aired and when we were growing up where when the television was on if there was an Asian on TV we would get called into the living room and so we were given special provisions to stay or stay up late to watch the first episode of Goodness Gracious Me. This sketch and that first episode is sort of our like never mind the bollocks punk rock sex pistols moment 
Um, <laughs> it was a sort of year zero for a lot of people who are now uh, working as comedians because uh, we just we we'd never seen Asians be funny, and we we had certainly never seen Asians be in comedies where we were in control of the jokes. It's one of those one of those ones that I think when we were on our live tour and we all felt like rock stars when we did it. Um, I know that people would sometimes shout out our lines before we would get there. Um, and that used to fascinate me because it was just like, sorry, uh, you know, I'm, we're waiting to actually perform it, but you know it, they knew it inside out, like you would songs at a concert. You know, it had a real rock and roll feel about it, the, that kind of lifestyle even that we had going from city to city performing this. And I mean, if I'm very, very honest, when when we kind of went on tour with it, um, my instinct was, uh, I, I was nervous because I wasn't sure, you know, how well it would be received, but it just blew us away. We were sold out and people, ju just the love for what we were doing. We're going to hear at the night that Nish Kumar was in it, Himesh Patel was in it, S Sindhu V and Bisha Kayali. Uh, so let's hear a clip. <laughs> well, well, darling, why don't you have, huh? why don't you have something a little bland? <laughs> hey, damn awesome! Huh? <laughs> hey, damn awesome! <laughs> <laughs> give her, give her something huh, that is not totally tasteless. Well, <laughs> the, the, the steak and kidney pie is only a little bit bland. Mm -hmm. and there you go, eh, Susie. <laughs> there you are. Eh? Eh, why don't you have the steak and the kidney pie? Ah. Huh? <laughs> but you know, I'm worried it blocks me right up. Ah. You know, I won't go for toilet for Starting. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. Nina, that's the point of going for an English. <laughs> Go on, Mira. Mira, what are you going to have? I'll die I'm... for constipation. <laughs> you know, 20 years I've had this constipation eating English food. And the odd occasion is the diarrhea comes in strong. <laughs> How was it for you, Nish? I mean, to be fair, you corpsed your way through it. You laughed more than you acted. There was no acting. I was just like, I looked like, it looked like someone had won a competition from the audience to just sit on the stage. Like, and that, like, it, I, it, I can't describe what, an, uh, what an, uh, a sort of out of body experience that whole, that whole thing was it's you, you sort of and it's an opportunity you don't think you assume you're never going to get you know like it's like sort of like when you're a kid you're like well i'd like to be in goodness gracious me and the simpsons and you know eventually you evolve that into i would like to have a career in comedy but you certainly don't imagine yourself being able to be in those things with the people who did them originally it's it's mad i've done lots of little bits with all of these people because i did it had a writing job on the sky relaunch of the kumars and then when uh, and then i did the studio warm-up when they had the goodness gracious me sort of reunion show so i've been very fortunate to sort of pop my head in and do little bits with all of them which is you know which is very sort of gratifying i think it sort of increasingly convinced my parents that i had a job what i hear from that niche is that we employed you but you haven't employed us <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> That's a really good point. Very good point. Because now you do the mass report. What's that like about? <laughs> this, this is the most Asian shit I could ever imagine. <laughs> the community elders are coming back to get what's theirs. Respect. <laughs> the interesting thing about it, actually, was that is the, the spirit of the Secret Policeman's Ball. You know, one of the exciting things about me being a kid and watching those early shows was the fact that you had Rowan Atkinson being involved uh, in the Four Yorkshiremen sketch or that you had pythons replacing goodies or 
you know, uh, beyond the fringe people replacing pythons and, and all that kind of stuff. So very much just that little clip there seemed to be very much in the spirit of the Amnesty shows, which is lovely. Can I ask, does anyone have a favourite line or moment from this sketch? No, I was just going to echo, I was just going to echo what, what Nina said. I mean, particularly the tour, that was pure rock and roll, wasn't it? And I think that's when we, mm. it was so joyful to be a part of this troupe. Um, I remember when we first got together, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but for me, it felt like coming home because I'd spent so many years finding things funny that no one else did around me and mm. making up characters and doing comedy stuff that no one else got. And then I, you suddenly find yourself in a room where everyone has the same reference points as you and you have this incredible creative shorthand. Mm. And you go, oh, I'm not mad. Actually, this is funny. And you find it funny too. And I can't describe what that was like, but I think the spirit of that finding a voice and expressing it joyfully, it's there in, in the material. Are there any final words that you have about Amnesty International or um, uh, human rights? When Amnesty came into my life many, many years ago, it was through a theatre called Mazdaq Theatre Company. And it was a humanity in that to find tortured political prisoners all over the world and how Amnesty stood up for that. And for that simplicity of that humanity, of equality, of justice, that's what you know what we asked for and that's what i asked for and i think that's what we stood for as a, as a company when we created that piece of work it was that equality in that and a joy and it was a real celebration of that deborah i have to tell you very quickly so this is my original shirt from goodness knows how many years ago when we did the amnesty thing i have oh. i have a little box with very special memories and i found this in that box because this was Oh, one wow. of the things that really one of the concerts meant the world to me to be a part of so this oh, is the can actual you stand original. up and show us because they're going to use yes. this for sure yeah. uh, where where hang on oh, oh. It so that shirt <laughs> is from secret policeman's ball we know where you live live yes it is <laughs> you were so punk rock nish was right yeah. thank you so much you. you've been so wonderful uh, can I ask for a big round of applause because we don't have an audience. You are your own audience. Uh, so can I can I ask for a big round of applause for Mira Sayal? Woo! Yay! Woo! Yay! Yay! Woo! Yay! Nina Wadia. Woo! Kulvinda Gia. Woo! Yay! And soon to be phoning you with employment in America, Nish Kumar! <laughs> Woo! I have been Deborah Francis White. You've been an utter delight. Thank you so much, gang. We just can't appreciate it enough. This pandemic we're all in is a human rights crisis in the most immediate sense. And Amnesty International UK are campaigning to protect everyone through this. If you'd like to support us, and you know you would, please visit amnesty.org.uk forward slash join hyphen unlocked or amnesty.org.uk forward slash donate hyphen unlocked. Or if you're on Facebook, you can click that donate button right now <laughs> to help build a world we want to live in together. Next up is our live Q&A, so don't go away. And this Friday, the 5th of June, 7.30 p.m., we are streaming the full-length Secret Policeman's Ball. We know where you live live from Wembley Arena on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Hello, welcome back. I'm Deborah Francis White and you are at the Secret Policeman's Ball Unlocked. So firstly, I want to send a very big thank you to all the brilliant comedy giants who have performed for Secret Policeman's Ball performances across the years, including the brilliant Eddie Izzard, who was the comedy glue that curated and held together We Know Where You Live Live 2001, the show that this brilliant sketch featured in and who passed the baton on towards me uh, 20 years later. Uh, so a big thank you there to Eddie. Now, uh, very excitingly, we have to answer your questions live, the wonderful Sanjeev Bhaskar and Nina Wadia. Welcome, welcome, Hola. welcome, and thank you so much. 
Um, so first of all, uh, the first question I'm getting in my ear from the uh, from from the viewers is who was the funniest out of the goodness gracious me gang? Sanjeev, who was uh, who funniest? Who are you asking? Uh, well, me and Nina, obviously, because we're the ones who are here. <laughs> oh, right. yes, fair. The others, listen, yeah. the others aren't here, they miss out. Nina? Yeah, I, I concur. <laughs> right. So, uh, so absolutely, throw them under the bus. They've not, they're not, they're, they've not turned up. Um, uh, did you, do you have any special memories of the secret policeman's of, have, do you have any special memories of the Secret Policeman's Ball that you did that you that didn't appear in that video? Uh, me? Well, um, we did go rather off piste towards the end of that sketch, uh, where we somewhat departed from the script, and and I remember that uh, oh. it was Nina's Nina's line, I think, which was, "I'll have a toad in my hole." I think they just <laughs> sent the it down. That was not me. <laughs> no. It was you. You, you had the line. It was not. It was not. You said she'll have a toad in her hole. And I remember that very uh, clearly. After, because you'd already said it. And so I said, <laughs> she'll have, yes, she'll have a toad in her hole. And could you make sure that it's greased around the rim? And wow. it's safe to say wow. that that was not. I think that's a culinary term. I don't think that's anything. Is that bad? Is that a bad thing? So. I'm no, so glad actually... you pronounced culinary properly at that. <laughs> I, uh, I remember that being a riff at the Edinburgh Festival when we did uh, with Kul, Kul, so Kulvinda came up for that. And then there were lots of contemporary uh, comedians there who were sort of, you know, up at the Edinburgh Fringe at the time. Not that you're not contemporary, but you're not still having to do the Edinburgh Festival. I think that's very clear. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I just want to make it clear in the VT that most of what we heard was actually Kulvinda gear. Um, so we have a question here from Caitlin. How has it been getting back together for this virtually, if not in person? And uh, any plans for a reunion with Nish this time, maybe? Uh, so this was your first time back together, you said, when we did the, the Zoom room, uh, uh, for the first time that all of you had got back together. How was that, seeing each other in lockdown? Well, I've, I've got to say, I, I thought it was particularly special. Um, firstly, because it was the first set of humans I'd seen since the pandemic. So to be honest, I would have been happy to see some goats and a bit of cheese. But the truth of the matter is... <laughs> well, that's made me feel better. <laughs> Great. I'm really glad I'm here. It's all right. Hey, you it's you called Vinta Gear. Don't say, oh, don't hey. say anything bad about the Vinta, Nina, because he's behind you. It's not panty right, season, no. but he is behind Nothing. you. No. Oh, there you are, cool. Oh, so good to see you. Oh. But yeah, that's... We were just talking about we all saw each other, you know, last week. We kind of did yeah. this whole sort of um, Zoom call together. How special it is, and it's 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 one of those things where we really were a bit of a family when we worked together. You know, we we knew uh, each other's most annoying habits as well as like what just really made us laugh. And I think that's just what it reminded me of again. Uh, Colvinder, I just have to point out that uh, just before you joined that Nina did refer being as happy to see us last week as she would with a bunch of goats. <laughs> I think it's just and a bit of cheese. Don't forget the cheese. <laughs> the cheese is the best part. She okay. said she's so far into lockdown, she's so desperate to see anyone, it wouldn't have mattered if there were goats on the Zoom. But I don't think she meant she wasn't thrilled to see you. Um, oh, man. <laughs> no, uh, any plans for a reunion, Kulvinda, maybe with Nish Kumar? Oh yeah, most definitely. Why not? You know, I think. Okay, you heard that here. That's an exclusive work. scoop. Uh, that's <laughs> you know, as soon as we're out of lockdown, we want a goodness gracious me reunion with Nish Kumar. I mean, I don't know that you should have Nish because honestly, all he did was laugh. He just he well, just sat on the stage roaring with laughter at Kulvinda mostly. Well, that's that's why we should have him on, see, because he's just great. Because he just roars with laughter, and and, and that's sometimes what's needed. <laughs> I mean, it's like having the audience on stage. It's like having the audience on stage with you. Um, I've got a question here from Wahida. Um, 
they say with not taking the typical career path of a doctor or an engineer what issues if any did you face from family and society going into comedy so i think this is a question uh from an asian viewer about uh uh p potentially uh parental expectations around career paths well, um, from, from my end, my mum was hugely disappointed because I was meant to be coming over from Hong Kong where I grew up to the UK to read law. And I literally went straight to drama school <laughs> and tried to oh, get away wow. with it. Yeah, and my mum didn't speak to me. We lived in the same house, but she didn't speak to me for about four months. It was really horrible. Oh, wow. But it was at that time, it was certainly tough, you know. Um, but then the minute she saw that I was actually going to be working and I actually enjoyed what I did, um, she became my number one fan, so that was it. Was it was nice, but it was tough. Yeah, mostly mostly parents come around whenever there's a red carpet. That's what I find. Everyone I've showed is <laughs> just tickets. worried about yes, the future. Absolutely. Unless Sanji. you're fitting it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, unlike uh, my um, fellow goodness gracious mears, um, I came into it really late, so uh, I had a. A, a sort of laughable career beforehand in marketing and business. So uh, I was 33, I think, when we started. And uh, uh, so I basically won my parents' expectations so low that by the age of 33, uh, I could pretty much do anything I wanted. So at that point, it was uh, um, going for something that I really enjoyed, and uh, I was I was incredibly and have remained incredibly fortunate that the first thing that I did was was goodness gracious me. Wow, that. that was the first well, thing you did. Well, that's irritating for other comedians, if you don't mind me saying. We prefer you to have yeah, well, slept around playing an audience of seven uh, at the Edinburgh Festival. Well, the thing is, I mean, uh, here's the interesting thing: that people would. Uh, uh, other actors, not these guys, these guys are lovely, but other actors would tell me that I was just lucky that I'd never had to struggle. And I had to point out that the kind of, you know, 10, 12 years that I worked in other businesses, not doing what I wanted to do was my struggle. So yes. I was really fortunate to find my way to it. But, uh, but yes, you're Indeed. right. To be also, yeah. Clearly, you're just talented and, and you got very successful very quickly. Uh, annoying, but fair. Um, so a question from James, do you think getting into comedy and acting has gotten easier for BAME performers or is, is it still limited? Sorry, who's that question from? James. Uh, is jo it harder? Jams. <laughs> Jams. Jams. It's from Jamez. Um, uh, or as Jam Ars, as uh, Kulvinda uh, insisted on calling him, uh, Tom Tuck, who appeared in the sketch in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, uh, do you think it's 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 getting easier for performers now? Uh, Kofinda, you um, look you look keen. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm willing to go back to two questions because I just can't seem to get in there. Now I'm going to do. As for my as for my parents, wanted great aspect expectations for myself. I think I was on the roulette table. It was a gamble. My eldest brother was in one sense the. The, the bright brains, the first guy to get a degree. The second one was the strength, the honesty, you know, the one who always moved the family forward. And I was the youngest in there. I was the roulette. I was a gamble. And, and uh, that was it. And, and but Did you have, what do you do did you have youngest what child you do privilege? Because they no, don't mind. It, they uh, think, oh. Well, see, when you're 10, <laughs> what privilege do you have? <laughs> but, but, but sharing... But sharing but but sharing your bed with your grandma and your brother <laughs> in a box. Oh, okay, that's, that's, that's the other side of it. But just some, some youngest children that's say, another, that, oh, well, my story. brother became a doctor and my sister became a lawyer. Then they went, oh, darling, you can do whatever you want, be a performance poet, because they've already sort of fulfilled their ambitions for their children. So do you think because you well, were the youngest that they, they didn't mind so much? I got away with murder being the youngest because, you know, uh, because out of a, out of siblings in that respect you know you just went on your way with, with your passions and your desires and when you're 13 and at the auction and doing working at city varieties in leeds doing impressions mm. and next next minute is a roller coaster next minute you're doing take take one take two sketch show for leeds youth players and the next minute you're going to drama school and you're telling your parents it's further education what do they know it's further education <laughs> 
<laughs> you know. You've had it. And then, they, and, they say, and then they say it's a hobby. He'll he'll grow out of it. He'll be on drugs. He'll get this. He'll be doing that. He'll be, he'll run away with a white woman. No, oh, no, no, no. He won't. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. He'll get back on the path. He'll be straightforward again. But you know, you're the youngest. Why not? Play the roulette. I was expected to play the roulette, and I'm playing the roulette to this day. Wow, that uh, was that was. Can I just sort of like you <laughs> to, uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, G Mars's uh, question about yeah. um, sort of BAME performers? I think that it is easier. I think than when we started, because I think there are more examples out there of people who've managed to achieve a career. But it's still a struggle, and the you know the lack Ooh. of diversity on screen, uh, particularly. Uh, is is still pretty apparent, you know, given how many people pour into it. And the one thing that I would say is kind of, you know, understand the industry and understand what your, your unique voice is, because uh, occasionally it may take a little time before your unique voice finds its place. But it's it's undoubtedly still a struggle for BAME performance. I'll tell you one um, thing I, that I, I found very interesting when... when um, when sort of EastEnders came my way and I met uh, an actress who had been on it before, was a very dear friend of mine, Janet Dibley. And I remember she said, so what's your character like? And I said, well, what I've been told so far is they want me to create a Muslim woman, you know, who has, at that time she was a single mother. And she, you know, it's really interesting. She says, when I get cast, I get told I'm playing an alcoholic. You get cast and you get told <laughs> the religion and the culture of the person that you're playing. And that's exactly what happens in castings with BAME actors. They don't, you know, it's not really about the character that you can create and all the qualities of the character. It's about your background and what you are and are not allowed to do. Um, so I find that, I hope that that goes away because I think it's, you know, when you, when you go in as a character actor to do stuff, you just want to know what's your character quality. You don't necessarily need to know what the religion is, you know, as the first point port of call. But I think that's Indeed. the advantage of uh, stand-up as a form, is that it is your voice. You have control over yeah. that narrative. So people like Nish and Ramesh and Sindhu and all the other people who are, are doing great work um, uh, across the board, uh, they are presenting their voice. They're in control of that voice. That's the one big advantage of stand-up. Yes, that's the only advantage of stand-up, can I tell you that, Sanjeev? That's literally, <laughs> you've named it, you've identified it, there's the advantage. Other than that, it's all just staying in travel lodges and premier inns, having a, having a ginsters. Um, I've got a question here from <laughs> Nina. Can you mm -hmm. say, Nina, can you say, please, for this questioner, I don't know their name, uh, one small aubergine? Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Who is the person? Who wrote that in? Was it you, Kuli? <laughs> <laughs> ah, 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 ah. You do not have to do that. I'll move on to another No, question. I'm not going to. It's so insulting. <laughs> and by the way, please stop sending me aubergines to sign. They go bad. I don't know what you do with them. <laughs> so please stop it. Stop it. Everybody stop with the aubergine content. Stop with the aubergine. And whoever came with the aubergine emoji, honestly, they want to kill them. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's taken a turn. Uh, Nina, <laughs> this, is a, this is a more respectful, better question for you. Did you, you have any idea or did you understand the impact that you had on young brown children who had never seen people who looked like them represented on television? Gosh, not at all. Can I, I want to be really, really honest about this. When we did, goodness gracious me, I'd just come out of a show called Do You Eat With Your Fingers that we'd done at mm -hmm. Theatre Royal Stratford East. And literally it was like a little review show. We had so much fun doing it. And then, you know, I got um, uh, taken over to do goodness gracious me. And I remember thinking, I just really hope that, you know, Asians in this country like it. So then when it actually, um, it, it took off in the way that it did and everyone embraced it, it was an absolute shock for me. I genuinely didn't think people would get it. So I did not know that. And I, I remember that when, you know, we, I think we'd done one series and the second series was happening and we'd been invited to some event or the other. And everyone was talk, talking to us like, oh, well, you guys are role models. I'm thinking, how can you be a role model having done just one little sketch show? I don't understand. Uh, so for me, it was an absolute shock to the system. 
Um, so just to be associated with it and be part of it is one of the most special things in my life. That's that's really lovely to hear. And the impact that it had on this country as well in, in, in that it was uh, very precious and owned by an Asian audience, but it wasn't only, wasn't only for an Asian audience. And the goodness gracious me family and the Kumas became everybody's family. And that, that I think did re remarkable, comedy, comedy can do remarkable things and light entertainment can do heavy lifting. It really, really can. Um, Sanjeev, uh, you may have already answered this, but Luke says, what contemporary comedy shows or comedians would you personally say are in the spirit of goodness gracious me, as in giving a voice to a voiceless community? Uh, so you've already mentioned some of the most, um, you know, uh, current topical Asian voices, but are there, is there anybody else that inspires you uh, as, uh, rep it's, it's, it's really awful to say an artist is representation because they're just telling their own story as well and they don't have to represent a whole community. Uh, but is there anybody that you feel has done that? Maybe somebody even surprising? I think that um, I mean, there are a number of people who are doing it and uh, doing it in clubs who may not get the platform of uh, broadcast. But I recently uh, was reading and then listening to an audio book, uh, Lenny Henry's autobiography. And that oh. puts a, a really kind of interesting context on that vein journey in terms of what he had to endure in the 70s being one of the first and certainly the youngest who was thrust into the spotlight and what he went through in order to remain uh, relevant um, given the pressures that were on him at that time. So, you know, it, you know, it's, it's worth looking at those people whose journey has, uh, who've traveled that road somewhat, because I think that that's a source of great inspiration for me, because I think people who are up there doing it, I think fantastic. That's where the momentum is. But if you want to learn from, uh, you know, people in terms of trying to inform your own journey, then you have to look at history, even if it's recent history. Indeed. Kulvinda, uh, I'm getting a question here. How did you manage to pull so many faces as Dennis Cooper? <laughs> <laughs> That was me writing in, Cole. <laughs> Go on, Cole, do a couple now. Go on. Ah, there you go. <laughs> because uh, I, I didn't realise at the time I was making so many faces. That's the thing. And another thing. Oh, really? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I, the, only, the only thing I knew was that uh, that character, Ding Dong, I, I, I looked at that, Leslie that Phillips. character, Leslie yeah. Phillips, Ding Dong, and I used to picture that in the back of my head as much as uh, uh, the comedian, Indian comedian was uh, Johnny Walker. So I pictured those two comedians at the back of my head. Uh, one was Indian and one was uh, Leslie Phillips. And uh, and one, once you put picture them, those faces automatically started to appear in myself because those are the two junctions of these characters meeting. Uh, That's interesting. And yeah, so I, did, I, didn't, I didn't go out necessarily thinking I needed to pull a face. I just thought of those people behind me. And I thought, ah, yes, ah, ding dong, oh, fruity. So those aspects <laughs> were much different. And then when the Indian, Indian Johnny Walker came in, if you know the old Indian actor Johnny Walker, he, the way he looked, the comedic, was it, 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 those elements fitted perfectly with this character, with Mr. Cooper, for myself, really. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, do you, I have a question in, what is your favourite sketch of all time? It doesn't have to be from Goodness Gracious Me, although it can be. Do you have a favourite sketch? Oh, my. Ooh. Wow. So hard, I, I, there, so there, are two, there are two Python sketches that I really like, and I think the argument sketch, if people know that, I think is <laughs> phenomenal. I think the Four Yorkshiremen sketch, which uh, has been part of uh, uh, Amnesty, I think is brilliant. But also the fish slapping dance from oh, Python, yeah. I think has has everything. I think it's it's moving, it's satirical. Uh, the you know it's just it's got everything that comedy should have, including Sanjeev, fish. Sanjeev, if we got special permission at the Hackney Empire when we did a recent Secret Policeman's tour show to do the argument sketch. 
um, and uh, which they gave to us. And remarkably, we could only do it live. We couldn't record it. Um, but uh, uh, we did it as a satire on Twitter. Is this the room for an argument? And uh, oh, right. basically, yeah, like a like a like a trolling. Uh, and it was absolutely brilliant. People were hysterical. And there were lots of young people who'd never seen it before. But of course, it really works mm -hmm. because I think it's one of the great uh, science fiction projections, the room for an argument, because it is, twi when you think about it, it's sort of, is this, oh no, this is the room for abuse. Oh, sorry, over here. Yeah, um, that's right, yeah. It's, it's, it's completely that. Uh, Nina, any favorite sketches? Um, for me, if it's, if we were going to the Pythons, a parrot sketch for me was just unbelievable. Um, but. Oh, no, honestly, there's there's just too many. There's just too many. I mean, if we go like within within the actual show, within goodness gracious me, for me, it has to be um, Asian Top Gear still to date. I just think uh -huh. that nothing else makes me laugh and smile as much as that. More so because of the memories it brings back of that particular day of filming. I I just I've never enjoyed filming more than that day. <laughs> wow, Colvinta, favorite sketches. I have to go. I have to go to Spike Milligan, really. Uh, oh, take a long thought, way back. Well, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, especially uh, at the time when the, when he was doing really the absurdity of comedy as well, and taking those limits of comedy. You know, what shall we do now? There was no endings, and the continuity of that. And then the fortunate thing was meeting Spike Milligan, and then having to, him to sign my equity form. Uh, when I was applying for equity, so I have so, and when, hence meeting him at the Grand Theatre in Yorkshire with his, with his uh, uh, Australian hat hat on, with his dangling, and asking at that particular time why I wanted to do comedy, and I particularly remember him doing that comedy sketches he did at that time, and it really kind of played influence on myself. Yet he was taking those extremes with those characters, and making them yet funny, but yet there was a satire in there which i found really at that particular at that age growing up uh the other um uh, i think not the nine o'clock news was great at the time when oh, it yeah. did come out uh, and i think that's a great generational step what they were starting to do the work they were they were kind of exploring and, and the simplicity of that type of sketch show uh, especially with uh mel and griff the two guys moving and chatting i loved all the all, all the rap that was happening in that form uh so there's been a lot of influences in the journey uh, of 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 developing sketches and sketch shows in that respect yeah wonderful uh this is a quick one from amelia did sanjeev's check please ever find love <laughs> uh, thankfully not no so um it, it's an interesting thing with check please because i checked with friends of mine uh uh perhaps over recent years given what was happening socially and in society as to whether you know that character was really sexist or not and you know my my female friends uh and feminists uh, said no, they didn't find him sexist. And I found that really interesting. And I, I kind of wanted to know why they felt that. And they kind of said, because there's an innocence to him. It's not a kind of nasty, manipulative guy. He's an idiot. And uh, like, like you know, so many of us guys are. Um, so yes, thankfully he didn't find love. Otherwise we could never think about returning to see how his uh, dating escapades have continued. That would be a great one for a red nose. They love bringing stuff back. Um, so uh, this is an interesting question. Did Goodness Gracious Me have a predominantly BAME crew and did it make a difference whether it was or wasn't crewed by BAME members? And it may have been whether there was a, an Asian crew or a BAME crew available then. We didn't, um, as far as I remember. Sorry, yeah. go on, Sam. To my memory, the, the, yeah, yeah the, my, to my memory, there wasn't. Yeah, I was going to agree with you, Nina. I think, but also, what was unusual was that we had, uh, you know, producers, writers, and performers that were, and I think that was um, a huge leap forward in terms of representation uh, in front and uh, behind the camera. Uh, but certainly, by the time I, I was doing the Kumars, we did have uh, Bane people in cameras and sound that I do remember, but that was a few years later. So I think it was more about availability at the time rather than a, an agenda. Um, 
that's great though that in quite a, quite a short period of time uh, that that uh, that talent pool was developed. I think that talent uh, yes, pool goes and, and a little also, bit and, and further back. Yeah. No, the talent pool goes a bit further back. Whether that Bain crew was around when we were doing the Real McCoy. You know, when Lenny was there, as much as, you know, the, the, the crew, the, the members that were involved and the writers that were involved there. Don't forget, that was laying what was going to be in the future for what was going to be laying part of goodness gracious me. Whether the ideas of employing of people from different backgrounds, that was that seeds were being, were being planted there. Uh, and then when goodness gracious me started to happen, only we only found that, like Sanjeev said, only the members of the cast that remained in, in, in that group. Yes, I think other members in time did start coming coming there. Interestingly, in our second series, we were sent to Birmingham uh, because there was more of a more of an ethnic ethnic crew there working there and they wanted and they wanted the program to take it to to Birmingham and Pebble Mill over there. Uh, so, there's an there's a uh, this this sort of this question links on. Um, in terms of talent pool, there's a young, uh, in, there's a there's a young aspiring uh, c comedian uh, who's asking, what advice would you give to young aspiring Bain comedians today? Any advice for someone coming up, but you know they're not they're not successful yet, like Nish or Sindhu or Bisha K Ali or uh, they're they're any advice? They'll, they'll take anything at this point. <laughs> I mean, from, from my end, genuinely, it's it's perseverance. Um, and, and it's also this, it's a really difficult question to ask because at the end of the day, there's there's so much, and, and I don't mean to sound facetious, facetious here, but there's so much luck involved in this business. Um, you know, I still to date meet incredibly talented actors from all backgrounds, all races, all cultures, and some who are in their 70s and 80s. And I just think, you know, how have you not been seen? How have you not had a massive, you know, career on television or in film? And it's because there is there is that thing of, I think at some point when things don't work out the way you want them to, some people give up. They just kind of go, well, this is too hard. And there is something to be said for perseverance in this industry. So my, my advice would be to just keep going and do the roots, you know, try and get into the fringe, you know, set, write your own material, get a YouTube channel, there's so many things you can do now that we couldn't do in our day. In our day, it was That's literally so just true. get your weeks on for equity, you know, just get your weeks in. Um, That's so, so true. There, there is a you, lot can, of you can make a sketch in lockdown and absolutely break through. If lots of people love it, then, you know, yeah. lots of people love it. Uh, you're not Absolutely. dependent anymore on the, on the, on the gatekeepers. Um, yeah. Kovinda, any, any advice for young comedians coming yeah. up? Commitment. Like, you know, it's it don't don't do it. think it's just for two years or one year or a flash in the pan. Think think for longevity as well. Uh, you have to in this line of work because if you think it's given to you on a plate, then I think you have to, you, you can't expect that. Unless you're Sanjeev, your... and then the first show you do will be a huge hit. <laughs> no, but <laughs> but the joy is actually the journey. Sometimes the journey is better than the destination. See. And that's, I agree, always cool. to and that's always to remember that uh, the joy is the journey and sometimes the destination doesn't matter. It's going on that journey and, and enjoying those audiences and enjoying those spaces that you're going to play. And, and at the same, as much as the characters you're going to get to play, uh, just keep in there the commitment of it, really. And finally, Sanjeev, any advice? I think uh, completely backing up what the other two have said, but also, uh, you know, hone your craft, you know, take care yeah. of it and, and, you know, sculpt it and shape it. But also um, get people around you who will be honest with you about your material, because it, it's very, very difficult to kind of hone it down on your own with no perspective. So get people around you who, who get it, who understand it, but who aren't afraid in the nicest way to tell you what doesn't work. That is absolutely wonderful advice and uh, advice that I feel like um, I still need to hear. 
Uh, thank you so much for coming back uh, to, for this phenomenal reunion and to telling us so much about it, being so generous with your time, especially as we had technical difficulties. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Amnesty International really appreciates it. Uh, human rights thanks you. And speaking of human rights, gang, at home, uh, on the screen below, you'll be able to see links. If you're on Facebook, click the donate button. Um, go and give Amnesty a follow. Go and join Amnesty International. You can join for like four pounds a month and you get so much stuff. If you're feeling frustrated at the moment with the state of the world or even devastated, uh, even if you have, a, does anyone, I don't know if anyone else has a low level headache and nausea all the time looking at the news at the moment. Um, Amnesty is fighting for human rights and they make it easy. They say, right, we're going to take this big army of a voice, uh, click here, add your name, uh, donate here. This is where your money's going to go. And they do get results. So come and be part of the Amnesty uh, tribe and army because it does make a massive, massive difference to feel like you're doing something. It might, you might think, oh, I'm only one voice, but you're not only one voice if you join Amnesty International. And there are loads of other wonderful things you can do as well. Um, to get involved. Um, so on Friday night at 7.30, we are back here, hopefully on time and with no technical difficulties, showing We Know Where You Live Live, the Wembley Arena rock star show that you saw a clip uh, with this gang in, and you're going to see the whole thing. So come back at 7.30, but don't forget to join Amnesty, uh, or at least give us a, a retweet and a shout out somewhere. Thank you so much. A big round of applause, and thank you for Sanjeev Bhaskar. Nina Wadia and Kulvin Bagheer. And also a huge thank you uh, to Mira and Nish who appeared on the video. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank, thank you, you from Amnesty International yeah, and me, Deborah Francis-White. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.